Buenos días a todos, buenas tardes ya en Ciudad de México. Eh, vamos a continuar con, con la siguiente sesión. Esta sesión se llevará a cabo en inglés, eh, tanto el audio como la, la presentación está en inglés. Confío en que la mayoría de ustedes podrá este, entenderla sin problema. Eh, John habla bastante, el conferencista habla eh, bastante calmado y, y, y se le entiende bastante bien. Entonces espero que con el apoyo de las láminas puedan comprenderla. Este es un tema para el que es difícil conseguir conferencistas eh, locales. Entonces decidimos eh, optar por, por, por apoyarnos en un conferencista internacional para este tema. Entonces vamos a comenzar. Eh, les presento a John Bailey. A, a John es Senior Manager en HP Software, la división de software en HP. John will be uh, showing us his presentation, A New Kind of Enterprise, presented by HP. Uh, thank you, HP, for being a sponsor of SK Virtual. Uh, John. Yeah, thank you for your time. Please go on. Okay. Thank you uh, for the introduction, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. So in this session, I'm going to talk through uh, some of the trends that we're seeing and what we believe that this means for, for application delivery teams. I'm uh, also going to discuss uh, also how these are informing the direction that we're taking with, a, with HP's software portfolio. And then secondly, I'm going to spend a little bit of time that, uh, Uh, doing a slightly deeper dive into some of the, the capabilities that we're offering today that allow application teams to deliver more effectively and with, with greater agility. So this is the, the application reality that we see today. And I don't think that this is going to be a huge surprise to anybody on the call. But you know, it really was not that long ago that you know, even you know, large companies for managing just, you know, a few large applications. You know, certainly that was the case at the beginning of my career. Um, today, however, um, you know, applications are the way that we do business. I imagine that most people on the call would have difficulty identifying a business process that isn't impacted by, governed by, or influenced by applications in, in some form or fashion. Now, this explosion of apps has certainly brought great benefit to business in terms of, uh, new data that we have about our business processes, uh, streamlined business processes, and new channels to, to customers. But there's, there's another implication as well, and that is that our, our business agility now depends on our application agility. We essentially, we don't get one without the other, and our businesses can only expand, grow, and change as fast as our applications allow us to. So, If you think about a, a modern business initiative and every, all, everything that goes into that, all the component parts, um, it, you know, sales, marketing, finance, et cetera, uh, it, oftentimes we'll see that the application development portion of that is one of the longest lead time, most costly activities. Also, in the last three to five years, you know, whatever you, you, time frame you pick, Uh, we have really, we've fundamentally changed almost every single aspect of how it is that we deliver applications. So the who, what, when, where, and how. So the who, you know, when we were managing just a couple big applications, you know, it was feasible to do that with co-located teams. Yet now, however, it's certainly the case for the majority of HP's customers, you know, we're dealing with distributed teams. And that may be out of choice, your organizations looking to take advantage of you know, lower cost offshore uh, cost structures, or it may be out of circumstance, you know, just due to uh, M&A activities, things of that nature. But the net effect, either way, is that we end up with stakeholders in multiple locations. You know, the what, the, the nature of the application itself is changing. You know, it used to be that when I built an application, it was a relatively self-contained thing. Uh, I wrote all the code, and then I stood that application up. Today, however, is certainly I'll write a portion of the application, but also I'm, I'm trying to reuse services or other components that have already been written that exist elsewhere across the enterprise or even outside the enterprise, you know, things like payment processing services, shipping services. 
basically the application you know, is moving more towards uh, being able to orchestrate a, a whole host of different services from a variety of locations. You know, the when factor, it used to be that we would do these gigantic uh, annual or biannual releases. We'd pull everything together as part of this massive extended process, and then we'd push it out, hand it over to our peers and operations, and basically say, listen, just don't kick the plug out, and it should be fine. And if you want to change, then it's something that we can perhaps get in 18 months from now when we do the next release. So you contrast that to today. We've got you know, agile teams delivering every couple months, every couple weeks, or in, in some cases almost continuously. Uh, but where, you know, I think we're all seeing the rise of cloud. We're all walking around with our, our mobile devices that we expect to be able to transact our, our business processes on. And in the how, you know, what we're seeing is a continual shift from the, the heavier weight uh, documentation-centric processes like waterfall to the more flexible, nimble processes like agile. Uh, I think we presented with Forrester a couple months ago, and they, they talked through the statistics that they're seeing in terms of agile adoption. And in 2009, I believe it was somewhere around 35%. In 2010, it was between 38 and 39%. And they're, they're projecting that for 2011, the agile adoption will be somewhere in the, the low to mid-40s once they finish tabulating the results. So definitely a, continu a continuous shift in that direction. Now, this is the, the other reality that we see, and it's that as organizations have adopted the different trends, the, the, the things that I've just put up on the previous slide, you know, we're running into problems. And you know, this isn't a surprise, to be honest. Uh, you know, none of these things are easy, and organizations, whether intentional or not, end up adopting these things in parallel with one another. And the net effect is it ends up being complexity yeah, times complexity versus complexity you know, plus complexity. And that's why you know, when we go out and try and see how we're doing as an industry, there are uh, horror stories like this that are lurking out there in terms of not de delivering what the business expects or just the, the sheer number of projects that fail. And what, what's interesting for me is you know, when I started in software development you know, almost two decades ago, um, I, I was given kind of the same stat that 70% of projects fail. So I think the question becomes, you know, with all the advances that we've made in terms of our, our languages and our platforms and our methodologies, why do we still continue to have this sort of frustration in the results that we're actually delivering? So I'd like to you know, put forward one hypothesis on, on why that is. So these are, are three of the major trends that we see a lot of HP customers grappling with right now. So agile, composite, and cloud. So when I say agile, what do I mean? So when I talked about that 18 month project, you know, typically how, historically how we would break that up is we would have three months requirements, three months design, six months build, and so on. You know, with agile, what I'm doing is I'm condensing you know, all of those activities in you know, a two to three week sprint where I perform you know, everything necessary to create working code and for, on a much smaller portion of the application, and I push that out to, to the business and to, to get validated. I get feedback on that, and I incorporate that feedback in our IT. So, um, you know, fundamental change in terms of how it is that, that we do our jobs as software professionals. That, that's agile in a nutshell. Um, composite, so what is composite after? This is the notion that uh, I want to reuse services rather than write every single line of code in the application myself. Okay, I want to uh, build a service in my enterprise, and then I want any application that needs that particular piece of functionality to be able to, to reuse that service. Uh, and that means that I'm not you know, rewriting something over and over again, and it means I can maintain it in a single place. And then from a, a cloud perspective, there's, there's a whole host of different use cases. You know, one of the more interesting ones for for apps teams is this notion of elasticity in the cloud. So if I'm, I'm building an application and I know that over time that demand is going to increase for, for the, the, that, the, that application services, what I may choose to do is to base that application in the cloud as opposed to the traditional data center. So as that demand increases, you know, the cloud's elasticity will take care of you know, adding the additional infrastructure to support the demand automatically. Now, 
the point here is, you know, we can certainly have very long, fruitful conversations around each of these different trends, each of these areas, and you know, we do that. You know, tricks and tips around what to do, what not to do. But one of the, the things that, that I wanted to point out is that there is a temptation for organizations to look at these things and adopt them sort of in isolation of one another. So the challenge becomes, you know, if, if not properly considered in conjunction with each other, you know, they can act, these things can actually end up being somewhat hostile to one another. So we've listed some of the points of contention here in, in orange. And, and I, I'm not going to walk through each of these, but I'll, I'll you know, give an example of one that I've actually lived through, and that's kind of the contention point between Agile and, and Composite. So if you're you're delivering an Agile, you're very focused on delivering you know, more quickly at higher velocity and getting that functionality to the business. And if I look on the other side, um, Composite, you know, I want to create services that can be reused across the enterprise. Now, there's a possibility of a conflict between the two. If I'm creating services that uh, can be reused across the enterprise, those services have to be ultra high quality, right? And they need to be very robust. Uh, if that service you know, falls over for, for whatever reason, and I've got a whole host of different applications calling it, then I've got a very real problem. But if I'm working in Agile, I'm trying to deliver quickly, you know, every couple sprints, uh, you know, there's a temptation to cut what? Well, well quality. So there's potential friction that can arise you know, between the two. And there's similar points of, of, of friction between uh, all of these. So I think... If we shift to the, the utopian view, how we would be, how we would propose that these things be considered, you know, in, in order to really capitalize on what these, the benefits that these trends offer, we believe they need to be viewed more in this fashion. So yes, we, we recognize that each of these has their own objectives. So reusability, elasticity, and velocity. But there also becomes a, a very interesting case for where these things overlap and the common principles or common DNA that they share amongst themselves. So I'll touch on these briefly. If I look at where composite and cloud connect, it's around durability. So I talked about you know, the need for services that we're building that are going to be used across the enterprise and why they need to be durable. Um, on the composite side, on the cloud side, you know, these, these are services that aren't necessarily going to function behind the firewall, but they need to be able to function outside of the firewall. And there's you know, new concerns around performance, security, and resilience that need to be taken into account when you're running your services outside of the, the enterprise firewall. The, the connection between cloud and agile, you know, this is all around responsiveness. So, so clearly, if we're, for agile, we're trying to deliver functionality more quickly for the business. On the, the cloud side, uh, cloud can actually enable this by allowing us to set up development and test environments you know, much more quickly. So we're no longer necessarily having to wait on an internal group to go out and you know, procure the hardware, uh, configure it, set it up, and you know, get things up and running for us. We can do that in the cloud you know, much more quickly with a, with a swipe of a credit card. And then the, the common thread between Agile and Composite is around you know, modularity. So for composite, we're trying to build these self-contained services. And then um, on the agile side, we're taking our those traditional large project plans and we're breaking them down into bite-sized pieces. And presumably at the end of each of those sprints or iterations, it, we're producing a potentially shippable code to use as the agile terminology. So there's a potential for a nice affinity between the two, being able to deliver those self-contained services within those small, more modular sprints. Now, what our, our view is that in order to achieve the benefit that the business is driving for, we need to be able to find a way to see these connections, and we also need to have the capabilities to master these connections. Now, if I expand this view out a little bit, I think this is probably a more accurate view of the world. So we've got our delivery trends that, that I talked about around you know, agile and composite, um, but we've also got consumption trends, you know, consuming this functionality through you know, mobile devices or through a rich rich internet application uh, user interfaces. And then you've got cloud, which straddles both the delivery and the consumption world. So 
you can you know, consume services and functionality from the cloud, and you can also use the cloud to facilitate and accelerate your, your delivery process by setting up development and test environments. And then sitting at the center of all of these things is you know, the reason that we undertake these initiatives in the first place. You know, our, our central aim should be better, faster outcomes. Now, don't worry too much about all of these details. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to walk through them, and I don't expect people to digest this. But the point I want to make with this slide is you know, where we're focusing is certainly to be able to support these trends and to have the capabilities to support the trends independently. But a lot of the investment that we're making is to support the overlaps and to have capabilities that allow organizations to you know, manage these touch points in an effective way together. Now, to try and make this a, a bit more concrete, I'll, I'll give just, just one or two examples. The, the first one is, uh, is service virtualization. And this is uh, a capability that we released last summer, and it's intended to address you know, one of the challenges that we see when companies are adopting a service-oriented type technology. Uh, what they often run into is just a challenge with the sheer number of parts and dependencies which exists when you're operating in this type of environment. And these can limit the expected agility of, of moving to a, a service-oriented type architecture if it's not managed effectively. So one manifestation of this is that if I'm a developer or a tester and I'm working on part of a business process that's made up of multiple services, I'm dependent upon the services that are upstream from me and that are downstream from, from my piece in order to note the work that I've done is has been done correctly. But oftentimes these, these dependent services, upstream or downstream, they may not be available for, for whatever reason. You know, it might still be under development. It, it may have limited uh, access windows. It's running off an old you know, a mainframe environment, for instance, that might be available only once every couple weeks. Uh, or it may be owned by a third party or, or a business partner. Now, historically, you know, how we've dealt with this as part of a delivery team is we've either had to wait for that service to become available, which, of course, impacts our plans, causes delays, and just introduces kind of a wasted time, or you, you build a stub. Um, that's, you know, that's typically what we would do when, back when I was developing. Now, building a stub is it's, it itself is a you know, costly, time-consuming effort, and it is uh, it's error-prone. It's, it's not as good as you know, testing and building against the, the actual service that you're going to be interfacing with. Now, what service virtualization does is it addresses this dependency by simulating or mimicking the dependent service. So you can you can either quickly configure it or you can actually put it out onto the network to monitor network traffic, and it's smart enough to understand the behavior, to learn that behavior, and then you can replicate these dependent services without having to build a stub. So just one example of a, a very unique way of, of leveraging technologies in order to help accelerate application delivery. Yeah. Another example is, is something that we've recently introduced as part of the, the IT performance suite, and it's, it's the executive scorecard. So one of the big challenges that IT leaders have today is just easily getting their arms around and understanding the overall state of their programs. So we have data all over the place. You know, most people, you know, teams have stuff in Excel and progress reports, email, and other various systems, and oftentimes, the data is in incompatible forms. And organizations often rely on you know, a program management office that's staffed with people who will you know, run around talking to project teams to understand the status, you know, plugging this into Excel and converting it to summary charts and putting it into PowerPoint. But in short, a very manual, error-prone process that at best produces a view that's out of date the moment that it's finalized. Now, addressing this challenge has been a, a big area of focus for HP, you know, automating this. So the, the executive scorecard is a, is a big step forward in achieving that. And what it provides is a single, unified, real-time view of the, the performance of your IT organization. So it allows you to surface all of the information um, you know, based on, I think, out of the box, something like 60-plus KPIs with the ability to customize and it lets IT leaders and managers kind of cut through the complexity to see what's meaningful to them. And then ultimately it, it allows teams to prioritize and better focus their time and energy you know, where it's needed. 
So just, just a, a couple examples of how we're addressing the, the overlaps of those trends. So another point that I'd like to call out is related to this picture here. And it, it kind of comes back to the fact that software delivery, you know, at its heart is, is fundamentally a team sport. You know, everybody does their part, you know, their piece of the puzzle, and you know, things come together to form a solution. But there's not a, you know, a single one person on a, a delivery team who can do everything that's required. But when we talk to, to customers and potential customers about how it is that they support their teams, we what we often see is a, a picture that looks very much like this. We find that you know, each of these different areas have been you know, examined and looked at and addressed but they've, they've been done so individually. So you may have your know, requirements off in Word or in a requirements capture tool. You know, somewhere else we have you know, test cases in Excel or in the database. And of course, project managers, they use another tool that sits somewhere else. Now, on the surface, it, you know, it looks good. You, you, you've outfitted everybody in all of the different disciplines with a tool. And you may have helped out each of these stakeholders a little bit. But what you haven't done is help the team out as a whole. And the problem is that the work in each of these areas is not isolated. So each group's work is related to the others. And so if there's a if there's a change in one of the areas, in requirements, for instance, it's the ripple effect that causes the lag and the surprises and the misunderstandings that I think we've, we've all seen on, on development projects at one time or another. And ultimately, this helps, it contributes to the, the wrong outcome. But to, to try and tie this together, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll try and summarize. We think that if you take this island approach to, to dealing and addressing these trends, and you, you couple it with what, what I've just talked about, um, you know, kind of this, this legacy uh, point tool approach for for addressing and supporting our teams, uh, the outcome is, is less than optimal. Now, when I ran delivery teams, there, there were three things that I said that if I had, I would be kind of golden in the eyes of the business, that they would view my group as being, being successful. If I had a high degree of predictability, meaning that if I could say with confidence where things stood, you know, when it was that I was going to be able to meet my objectives and whether or not we were on track, um, if I had high quality for, for hopefully obvious reasons, and then if I was change ready, meaning that if the business came to me and said that they wanted something new or something different, that I was able to turn on a, a, on a dime, react quickly, and make that a reality as opposed to being seen as being inflexible or unresponsive. This world here hurts all three of those things. You know, I, have, I have low predictability because I'm chasing these trends in isolation. I have team members you know, spread across various locations. I'm spending a significant amount of time just simply chasing down the information and aggregating it into a snapshot view of where I think things stand. Their so quality is impacted. And then ultimately it's very difficult in this type of environment for me to be responsive to change. And this stat here on, in the bottom right is, is very interesting to me. You know, Gartner's estimated that a, a large organization raises anywhere from 2,000 to 70,000 requests for change per month, which is a, uh, just alone is a, a staggering statistic. But if you, you consider the, the sheer challenge of understanding what any given change will mean uh, to when you impact that, when you've got an application with you know, hundreds of moving parts and people spread all over uh, different locations, you, you start to see the problem. It, it can take days, if not weeks, to understand a, a single change, and you, you multiply that out, and you, you know, it becomes almost impossible. And organizations today simply can't operate effectively with the, the type of latency that, that that implies. So the the new and improved world that we would propose, you know, firstly, it takes the convergent view of these trends, as I discussed. You know, it, it understands how they impact each other and works to harmonize them so you can achieve the maximum benefits. And then it, it, it couples that with a, uh, a unified solution centered around you know, ALM, Application Lifecycle Management, that's able to orchestrate all of these activities and collaborate across all of the delivery roles 
so that the delivery team can truly work together as a team. And then the results, as you would, you might hope and imagine, are the, the restoration of our delivery fundamentals, you know, predictability, quality, and change readiness. So predictability, you get kind of a single pane of glass that shows in real time the state of the overall program. And you know, this should be based on work from all of the different disciplines, and it should be based on binary metrics, such as you know, the number of requirements successfully tested. You know, quality is, is put at the center. You know, this uh, includes not just functional quality, but also non-functional quality, things like performance and security. And it's driven off your requirements. Make sure that you know, the requirements are you know, living, breathing reflections of business need, and to make sure that you know, the validation efforts that we're doing uh, are validating the requirements. And then change readiness. I mean, this uh, you know, it starts with using automation wherever possible. So we're stripping out the, the latency and the, all the handoffs that we see on, a, on an almost daily basis in our projects, and then it couples that with a, an end-to-end -end view of asset relationships and dependencies. So that means that I should be able to select a requirement that's under change and then instantly see everything that's potentially impacted as a result. So associated requirements, a test, even down to the line of code. And in this way, we can very quickly understand what needs to change. We can make that change and then we can go live with confidence that we've, we've identified everything correctly. Now, what I've been talking about so far really revolves around just the, the delivery portion of the application lifecycle. And you know, getting that right you know, certainly is, is not a small challenge. Uh, and I, I think it, 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 it's a significant challenge that organizations uh, are grappling with. Um, but there's a second reason that if delivery fails to deliver the, the expected business value. And it's the fact that a lot of organizations miss the fact that there is a, a broader life cycle. You know, an application doesn't you know, magically begin as a set of requirements. It starts much earlier than that as, as, a, as a business idea. And then you know, likewise, you know, an application's life doesn't end the day that it goes live. You know, speaking from experience running delivery teams, I think there is a tendency to you have this big push towards your delivery, you go live and you kind of steps off your hands thinking, oh, I'm glad that's over, uh, it's done. Um, but the reality is though that that's not the right mindset. And I'll, I'll put a stat up here from Gartner, where they estimate that for an application that uh, lives for 15 years, that the, the total cost of ownership, um, 8%, only 8% of that is associated with that initial build and go live. What that means is that 92% you know, of an application's cost is derived from subsequent trips around this broader life cycle. So um, maintaining the application, making updates to it, working with the operations teams. And this means that you know, decisions that we make in that deliver portion of the life cycle can have a dramatic impact on the, the other 92% of the application's cost. So, if you adopt this broader view and you solve for the complete life cycle, it allows IT to better understand and manage the true life of an application. So the, the complete life cycle includes everything that happens before requirements. So the portfolio investigation, the prioritization of features and functionalities that you're going to be implementing, uh, the planning, and also the architectural decisions that you want to make and put in place so that you've got consistency across your enterprise. And you, consistency will have a big impact on the ease of maintenance and the ease of, uh, and, and the overall cost uh, of your applications. And then it also takes into consideration you know, everything that happens once the application goes live. So how well is my delivery team connected with my operations peers? Are we sharing the right information? Have we you know, shared test scripts where possible? So operations isn't having to create their own. Am I linked into the service desk so that as issues arise in production, those can be easily channeled back into the delivery team so we can prioritize those uh, with everything else that might be in the application backlog. And then finally, it recognizes that you know, an application lives a useful life and really should not be maintained beyond that. That means providing a, a capability for archiving the application's data and being able to take the application offline so you those resources can be reprovisioned for, for higher value activities. 
Now, HP solutions, you know, we start with you know, really focusing on that the delivery life cycle. So this includes you know, requirements, quality management, and then robust integration into the developer's environment. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. But it also takes into consideration the broader life cycle. You know, we help customers solve for the complete life cycle, which means that you know, the delivery centers, the delivery solutions sit at the center of a, a fully integrated you know, life cycle solution set. And this closes the gap around things like DevOps, which I think we're starting to hear a lot in the industry about. You know, that, that is important, but it's only a portion of this, this broader life cycle. So we think this, this entire picture needs to be taken into consideration in order to really deliver the value that uh, the business is expecting from us as delivery teams. So that's kind of a higher level view in terms of you know, what we see as some of the trends and some of the issues that teams are combating today. So one of the things that I wanted to do uh, to make some of this more concrete is I'd like to talk through in more detail about exactly how HP supports some of the key personas that are involved in delivering uh, applications. So I'd like to give some examples for you know, the project manager, the business or requirements analyst, uh, developer and tester. So I'm going to kind of show how we can pull all of those personas together and allow them to work you know, more effectively together you know, as a team, as I was talking about earlier. So to do that, let me introduce you to the, the first persona. So this is the, the project manager, or if you're, if you're working in a, an agile environment, it's often referred to as a scrum master. I think though, though for the purposes of this, I'll probably frame this more in the context of the traditional project manager. So this person, you know, they have one of the toughest jobs in the industry. You know, they're responsible for tracking and reporting status, uh, guiding the team, you know, making sure that we're following correct processes, and you know, they take on track uh, and resolve you know, issues and impediments that, that crop up so that the team can focus on meeting their objectives. Now, the project manager's Monday morning you know, typically starts very early, and you know, very often this will be with you know, a, a large conference call with the entire team calling in to collect status. And this is oftentimes a very verbal batch update process with you know, everyone going around the room and giving an update on exactly where their work stands. And the PM is responsible for understanding all of this, assimil assimilating it, and then aggregating it into what they believe to be kind of that single view or snapshot of, of progress. And you know, they ultimately spend a significant amount of their waking hours of gathering this data, you know, polling team members, sending email queries, uh, just to get to that view. And typically, you know, they use whatever the, the IT department has provided in order to, to track the status. And more often than not, you know, that's Microsoft Project, which I think, as, as many of you recognize, you know, that's a, a document-based uh, solution. Now, Microsoft Project can be very powerful. It can pre create pretty charts, but fundamentally, it's a standalone you know, document. Now, one of the big challenges that this person faces is that everybody in the organization gauges project status based on these updates. And since they're batch updates, if issues are often lost, their concerns are glossed over. And the, the PM is so focused on just pulling everything together, it's easy for stuff to sort of slip between the cracks. The translation and the, the result is often that our projects are very typically, they'll be in a green status you know, all the way up until the point where they turn bright red. Uh, you know, PMs just don't get the visibility or predictability as I talked about earlier that they'd like to have in order to anticipate those sorts of issues. Now, in the HP world, we supply them with a, a unique set of tools so that they can be more accurate. Uh, it's no longer standalone unless some digit, digitized status from other team members in real time and it's based on information that's already in the system, already in the application lifecycle. And it allows PMs to be more accurate, more agile, and more effective. So let's take a look at, at what that is. Now, firstly and importantly, you know, the PMs log in using the same URL that everyone else uses. And this is important because it's the same application that everyone else is using. You know, Microsoft Project, standalone, separate, batch oriented. This is an embedded, streamlined, connected solution. So the PM clicks authenticate, and then they're taken to only the projects that they have expressed permission to see. Now, here they define the success criteria, the milestones, the deliverables, 
and the KPIs that help uh, determine if when a milestone is successful. And they do it in a way that you know, every project manager is familiar with uh, a Gantt chart. Now, we've got specific individual deliverables and gates that have to be hit successfully for projects to move forward. Now, you might say, okay, so what? You know, this is no different than Microsoft Project. Well, the magic comes in here. So each of these gates that have been defined can be digitally traced and linked to activities that are taking place in the application lifecycle. So, so what's an activity? Well, an activity is a test case that's happening. Uh, an activity is a, a requirements definition effort that gets completed. An activity is a, a development activity that gets completed or a performance test that gets completed. And once these are linked, the system goes into a, a report mode that's automatic, real-time, and streamlined. And a project manager can get instant visibility into where things stand, you know, where the KPIs are truly passing, and they have a much better sense of, of the overall status of the project. Now, what we typically see is that when you know, PMs, you know, organizations that have adopted this, you know, the PMs will still have those Monday morning meetings, but they do so now with context. You know, the meetings become much more focused on solving problems and truly advancing the project as opposed to just merely collecting data. So having this, this capability alone is a dramatic improvement for our teams. You know, the, the typical standalone, unfocused, disconnected approach that many companies are using today is costing them millions and millions of dollars. Okay, so move on to the, the business analyst. Uh, so requirements are, are the fundamental language that determine the definition of success for, for our projects. So they, they describe in detail exactly how an application should function, how it should look and feel, what specific business processes need to be digitized, um, what the non-functional requirements are on things like performance and security. And today, you know, most organizations turn to Microsoft Word to, to do this work. So once again, we're, you have a, a standalone, separate, disconnected, you know, document-based solution that business analysts or requirement analysts are using every day, to, every day to try and express requirements. Now, what this looks like at the end of the day is a, a document that is inches thick called the, the business requirements document. It's huge. And it is full of written prose that attempts to describe in detail what developers need to build. And this becomes the foundation of everything that organizations spend money on in software development. You know, our, de our developers design from it, our coders code from it, and our testers test against it. But the reality is, you know, this approach you know, is it, impossible to validate, it's impossible to verify from, and it takes an enormous amount of time to create. So our approach is different. You know, we provide the, the business analysts their own purpose-based app in which to, to manage requirements. So note that it's the same interface that the project managers log into because it's the same system. Now, one thing about business analysts that, that I've noticed as you know, part of my time in delivery is that they are aggregators as much as they are creators. So they bring together information from all different types of sources, so Excel, UML, Word, uh, Visio. The important thing, though, is that you bring all of this stuff together because once it's together, you then have the ability to trace from it. You have the ability to, to build from it and then to re also report status against it. So this is a, an example of a, you know, an Excel spreadsheet. And it's, at the top here, you can see it's from a, a JAD session. So the JAD is a joint uh, application design, or I've heard it, it referred to as joint analysis and design. But essentially, it's a, it's a meeting where all of the stakeholders get together and they debate what the application needs to do. So they're essentially eliciting capturing and defining requirements. You know, typically, the notes that are captured in some, are, are, are captured in some sort of free-form tool like Excel, you know, so this example here. Now, we, what we provide is the capability to, to suck this right into the, the system, the ALM system that the team is using. So what's the point? So each one of the items that you see here can then become a requirement. So at the top here, you see you know, online check-in. So on, on the next screen, you see it as a requirement within ALM. So the idea is, you know, once it's part of the system, you know, it goes into a complete version control you know, activity track repository. And it's, it's a global repository 
It allows the entire team, you know, no matter where they're based, to leverage this work. They can now understand the intent of what it is that we're trying to create, and we can trace back to it. And if changes are made, the, the version control system allows you to keep the original version, which you can always refer back to. Um, ALM also provides the ability for uh, BTMN models to be imported, so business process models. So the system allows us to interrogate these models and you know, automatically generate requirements from them. Now, we chose uh, BTMN because these are more often than not design hardened models that organizations use. And this means that they've already been validated, and in most, in all likelihood, they're already a reality. And by generating requirements from these, so it's, we know that it's a requirement that should be in use uh, by the organization as opposed to just being something on the, on the back of the map. So the system can interrogate every branch and then automatically generate requirements for you. So we're, we're leveraging the automation. Yep. Same version control, same ability to trace. Okay. Another one of the, the trends in the industry, especially in, in mobile app development, is to not just say what the application should do, but what it should look like. And this is done with, with mock-ups. So here is a, an example mock-up. Here is a, another mock-up. So this becomes a very another key form of expression for the team members. You know, you've heard the expression, a picture is worth a thousand words. You know, in this case, the picture it really helps ensure that what we're developing is in line with what the business and the users expect. Um, it, we, we use these on, on our delivery team you know, very quickly because we understood that if you have a picture, you know, everyone's much more likely to be talking about the same thing. And it means that what we deliver at the end of the day is going to be much closer to what uh, the business is after. It's, it's very easy to confuse or to misinterpret or interpret words uh, differently. Um, we allow you to attach mock-ups, leverage them, and distribute them. We've got integrations with some of the best mock-up technologies on the planet, and then these become part of the, the ALM repository that everyone can leverage. So the business analyst now has the ability to trace from the business process to requirements to test and even to the line of code. So now when all of the other personas log in, the teams are in a much better place to understand the exact intent of the application and you've got a much higher likelihood of building it right the first time. Okay, so the next persona is the, the developer. So developers work really hard and really fast. You know, they want to be able to check things in, check things out, you know, write code. They, you know, in essence, they are the engine of our delivery teams. And the last thing that developers want is to be regulated. You know, they very often have their, their headphones on, at least the, the developers that I know, they're head down and they're, they're focused. Yeah, they, they want to get work done. And typically on the developer screen is a, is an IDE, the integrated development environment. So what are the developers doing in the IDE? Well, they're, they're building to the requirements, they're fixing defects, and they're using information from other parts of the life cycle in order to do this. Now what HP does is provide that information directly to them. You know, we don't want to have to rip developers out of their environment, the, the ones that they're comfortable with, or have them bounce back and forth across a wide variety of tools. You know, it just would not be efficient, and it wouldn't work. What ALM does is it pushes the information that they need in order to be productive into their environment so they can see the tasks and the context in order to do their jobs more effectively. So this includes information around um, tasks, uh, requirements, tests, and defects, and it's all right within their environment. So as an example, you know, this is the Eclipse IDE. Uh, what you see here is our integration with ALM. So on the right-hand side, you see you know, defects from ALM. You can see requirements from ALM. And all of these are updated in real time from other you know, team members that are perhaps working within ALM. So an analogy that most people can follow is that the IDE is like Outlook, and ALM is like Microsoft Exchange. Now, here's another example. And this defect includes all of the steps uh, to, to reproduce the defect, and it's pushed right to the developer's environment. So they, they don't have to leave the IDE to get this information in order to begin working on it. Okay. And here is a, an example in Microsoft Visual Studio, so the Microsoft IDE. So it's the identical functionality, 
the identical information you know, right there for the developers uh, pushed to their environment. Now, even more powerful than getting this information pushed to the developer is now that you know, everything that the developer does is linked back to the other roles as well. So if a requirement is developed or a defect is fixed, if this, is, this automatically shows back up in ALM. If testers see it, the business analysts see it, and they know, you know exactly what's coming in the latest build uh, without having to go ask the, the, the developer you know, what's, what's coming, what have you been working on, what's the progress. And PMs, project managers, see it in their staff. So they know where progress stands, like I talked about earlier. You know, that the PM is no longer having to constantly walk around tapping people on the shoulder, you know, interrupting the developers who are trying to get the work done in order to get status. You know, that's now taken care of automatically. So this is a huge step forward. We, we now have much more insight into the tools that we're actually using to build our applications. And these, what have been historically siloed roles, are now in a much better position to work together more effectively. Okay, so the, the last percentage that I'll talk to is the tester. And yeah, HP's heritage is around testing. And this, this is derived you know, from the Mercury acquisition and all the investments that have occurred since. And you know, ALM embodies, what, 15 plus years of innovation for the tester. And there, there's more people per feature working on HP products than any other company in the test. And here, you know, we've highlighted some of the typical responsibilities for the tester, which I'm sure you, know, you all are familiar with. Now, as I'm sure you're, <laughs> you're now expecting, we have the same login, again, because it's the same system. Now, this is a, a testing resource tab. So, so why is this cool? So when you're, you're dealing with testers in a distributed organization with you know, massive amounts of data and information, uh, you need to be able to share the critical elements to be successful. Okay, that becomes very important. So what are critical elements? Well, there are things like function libraries. There are things like object repositories. You know, if we share these, we're able to really cut test maintenance. You know, things like data tables. You know, every other vendor that's out there doing testing, they, they, they ignore these sorts of things. You know, they talk about sharing scripts, things that you know, HP has been doing since 93. But this other information is just as important. And we've got you know, unrivaled capabilities for the testers in, in these areas. Uh, business process testing, you know, this has been an absolute grand slam in terms of team collaboration. You know, the components allow you to take logic libraries and centralize them. And then version control allows multiple teams to leverage these things concurrently. So instead of building you know, 500 different scripts to log in across your application portfolio, you build one. And if you need to change how people log in, you only change that one component. Uh, again, traceability is you know, phenomenal, backwards, forwards, sideways. You have a 360 degree of view that you can trace to any element. And that includes the, the business process requirements that I, I spoke about earlier. We have the world's most popular functional testing solution called UFT for the testers. You know, and the real value here is not just about the, the GUI interface and being able to test that, but it's also about being able to test services which are just inherently more difficult to test because there's not a button to push because there's not a user interface. The Sprinter, you know, this is the other thing that is extremely powerful. We can now really accelerate and make life easier for the manual tester. You know, it makes the, what can sometimes be a very tedious process of manual testing and less painful, faster, and more accurate. The so Sprinter allows you to automatically record the test steps that you're taking as you're testing something to aid in reproducing defects. So if a tester is doing exploratory testing, or perhaps you've got a, a business stakeholder that's you know, testing out your system, by being able to record all the steps that are taken, it's much easier to recreate a defect, and you're no longer having to you know, spend hours and hours trying to figure out exactly how you got to that particular area. I, I, can, uh, I can count. I can't count times that I've had developers sitting down with testers trying to reproduce a defect and just not being able to find it. This helps solve that problem. Sprinter also has mirror testing, which allows a single tester to drive up to six different machines simultaneously in order to test different browser operating system combinations. And it, I think what we've seen, I think all of us recognize that you know, different browsers are going to yield different results, and that's what, you know, why we have to test as many as we can. But this, in essence, transforms your one tester into six for this type of testing, 
and ultimately you end up with better coverage and higher quality. Uh, Sprinter has a native annotation and markup tools to make it clear to the developer exactly where the problem is, so there's less back and forth and clarification between the two groups. It also has the ability to make real-time updates to the test plan if there are corrections needed that are found during test execution. Uh, also, uh, as part of that, uh, ALM is an integrated version of Performance Center, so we've now got, you know, it's sitting in the same repository, so you've got a, a, the ability to incorporate performance defects into that overall view of project quality. And then lastly, you know, the true, true client technology has been a real revolution in being able to performance test things like you know, new web 2.0 technologies that many of us are finding ourselves building today. So technologies like AJAX can now be performance tested much more effectively and faster than we would have in the past. So that, that's the, uh, the whirlwind tour, just to kind of a sampling of some of the capabilities that support the entire application delivery team you know, in the manner that I was talking about earlier. So what's the secret sauce? You know, our assertion is that you know, all of the key personas are, are critical to moving to greater velocity and greater agility. You have to empower all of them. You, know, you can't just hand pick you know, one or two and expect to deliver organizational agility. I think there's you know, some folks in the industry that they have a tendency to have a very siloed conversation around agility. Yeah, they want to talk about the developer. You know, it's all about the agile developer. Or they want to talk about the business analyst. It's all about better requirements or, or the project manager. You know, hey, look, the new version of Microsoft Project. Our view and our, our holistic approach is that it's not about these individual problems. It's about all of them working together in concert. And you know, we provide the kind of the most unique solution to completely address you know, all of these needs across the, the complete life cycle. And more importantly is that we're completely technology and methodology agnostic. You know, we don't care if you're just doing Microsoft work. You know, we can support that. But nine times out of ten, that's not the only thing that organizations are doing. And we don't care if you know, companies are just doing web or just working in Eclipse or just you know, mobile or just agile. You know, we support all that, but nine times out of ten, you know, it's a combination of all of those things. And the, the HP diagnostic approach allows us to support all of that. We want to support you know, what companies have today and what they're likely to have in the future. And then finally, I, yeah, I touched on the executive scorecard. It just lets the app teams and execs you know, cut through all of the data complexity to really get to what's meaningful. Helps them see the problems that require attention and lets them focus on the metrics that really matter to them. And you know, all of this allows IT to perform better, which is really the guiding principle behind a lot of what we're doing and uh, the innovations that we're making today. So with that, I think that, that brings me to the, the end of the slides that I had prepared. I think, um, Pedro, I'll turn it, turn it back over to you. Thank you, John. Thanks a lot for your presentation. It was very interesting. Um, well, most of the questions have to do with if you will be sharing the presentation slides. Uh, I had already mentioned that. And we will be yeah, sharing them. Eh, sí, se van a compartir la, las presentaciones. Sorry. Um, one of the questions have to do with if HP uh, is uh, HP software is also uh, uh, has an offer for app stores, enterprise app stores. I don't know if it's something you can talk to us uh, about, enterprise app stores. Like in, intra-company uh, application uh, stores and mashup depots. I don't know if it's something that you are into. Yeah, that's, that's not my area of expertise, the, the application stores. That's, that's not uh, an offering that HP software has at the moment. That's okay. Uh, I, I can redirect questions to, to Manuel Castilla in Mexico uh, about that. Okay. Um, about uh, application stores. Uh, let me see if we have another question regarding... Oh, here. What is the main advantage or differentiation of ALM 11 compared to others such as, uh, for example, IBM Rational or Microsoft Catalyst? Sure. So, I mean, I, I, I hope that I tried to cover some of that off in, in, in the wrap up. Um, you know, we are, are really focused on you know, being, on being 
technology and methodology agnostic, so we can support you know, all of the different uh, technologies that are out there. You know, from a from a developer perspective, you know, we support Java, um, .NET, um, other IDEs. Um, I think that that's one place that we want to kind of be Switzerland on. We, we don't want to really say you have to use one versus the other. You know, we recognize that enterprises have a number of these different technologies, and we want to be able to support all of them. Um, the, the things that we're doing around the executive scorecard, you know, being able to tie together across the complete life cycle, I think we really see that as a differentiator. Uh, there, I, I don't know of other companies that you know, offer both the scorecard capability and the breadth of underlying uh, technologies and, and products to populate that scorecard. So you know, that's the direction that we're, we're moving in is to be able to to provide that type of visibility for, for the IT organizations so that they, they have the information that they need to, to perform more effectively. Um, another question, John, is, uh, is, is there any trial or starting options, or how can people get their hands dirty with the ALM 11? That's a, that's a great question, um, and I think, you know, first of all, I would, um, I think Manu, Manuel, um, I think it would be good if we could kind of send some information out um, to all the attendees on, on how to do that, um, to point people to the you know, trial versions and uh, more information on our, on our website. Okay. Um, les vamos a enviar información a todos los registrados a esta sesión sobre cómo pueden descargar o obtener versiones de, de evaluación de ALM11 y también si a algunos les interesa información de precios para que le puedan dar seguimiento. Uh, John, I just mentioned that uh, we will be sending attendees that are interested uh, information on, on, on how to to get started with ALM11 and pressing information and all that. Okay? Terrific. Well, thanks a lot for your time, John. We have run out of time. It was a great, great session. Um, thanks a lot for your time, and, and we'll keep in touch. Thank you, everyone, for attending. I, I really do appreciate it.